up everyone and welcome back to week five of the what's your why series and guess what y'all i'm still in the closet <laughs> not like that but um i know you guys are tired of that joke I'm, I'm gonna retire it after this one i promise <laughs> but today's episode features um a very very special guest and man i'm excited about having this guy on the show um when i initially put the post out there uh my bro shout out to rod butler um put his name out there and said this guy would be great and honestly we talk about this guy a lot um and i didn't think that he would respond or say hey i would love to be a part but when i asked him man he was like man i would love to be a part i would love to hear your heart just shoot me you know an email and, and let's connect and i was like man that is so awesome uh today's guest is none other than pastor Derek hawkins of the refuge church in greensboro north carolina um man this conversation that we have is so it's so deep and it's so enriching you know this man of god he is powerful man he is powerful he is the, the lead pastor at the um, or the campus pastor um at the greensboro campus and one of the things that i love the most about this conversation is that you know he leaves a lot of golden nuggets about being in god's presence um the altar altered me man that was my favorite quote and so many others man that you'll see uh it was a great time meeting this man of god and being able to connect um and being able to establish a friendship with this man of god and being able to just be in the presence of just greatness you know i think highly of this man of god i think highly of every single pastor that has um been a part of this show um, and I thank God that, you know, he has blessed me with this platform to be able to talk to all these pastors uh, and to be able to talk to a lot of these people uh, because, you know, everyone has a unique ministry. Everyone has a unique gift. And I thank God that, you know, there are people out here who truly love the Lord and truly love to help people. And one of the things about, you know, Pastor Hawkins was that, you know, he prayed about it, too. And he said, you know, I don't do things just just to do them, but I do things on assignment. And this was definitely an assignment. And I pray that the assignment blesses you guys because the words and the nuggets, everything that he drops, it, it truly blessed me indeed. I've watched this episode too many times as well. I watched all of them too many times because each and every one of them blessed me, uh, has blessed me. Uh, but this one, man, I love this guy. And by the time this airs, you know, it'll my birthday would have passed. Happy birthday if you guys love me. Um, but you know, I, 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 I thank God that, you know, we had this conversation that I connected with this man of God because he is truly a man of God indeed. So, um, if you want to uh, connect with him, definitely check out his website, DerekHawkins.org.com. Um, uh, all his information, all the pastor's information that you're interested in or want to know more about, their information is on the website, WeAreOneFaith.com. So definitely check it out. Check out every one of these pastors on what they're doing. They have podcasts. They have um, other ministries. They have things that they're doing that is really impacting the kingdom of God. So without further ado, because this episode is over an hour long as well, like last week, <laughs> and I want you to get, get all of it, and I don't want to keep talking. Um, enjoy the conversation between me and Pastor Hawkins. Here on One Faith Radio. I, I really love what you're doing uh, up there in Greensboro. Uh, I love what your church is all about. Um, I, I realize that your church is a part of a network of churches. One of the churches is down here. I think it's the main campus. I'm actually in Concord. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you serious? You yeah. in Concord? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bro, that's look, look. I could have. I was. Just, I just love Kannapolis. I could have came where you were, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> man, like we could have. We could have came. I could have came where you were, man. I just got out of staff meeting in Kannapolis, man. Oh, really? So oh, I man. stay. I stay in Salisbury. I just commute between Kannapolis and Greensboro because that's oh, wow. like two or three minutes from my house. Uh -huh. So yeah, I live in Salisbury. I commute. Born and raised in Salisbury. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. I don't know why I thought you were in like Durham or something. I don't know. Because I'm from Durham. I'm I'm okay. originally from Durham, from the Raleigh Durham area. But we recently moved down to um this location We're down here back in uh, coming up on a year in August. Um, oh, so what church do you go to? Down here, I go to Breakthrough Ministries Church of God in Christ. So okay, cool. Um, okay, all right. Church. Yeah, we we've been for a while. We were trying to figure it out where we were trying to go, what we were trying to do. Um, but you know, the Lord kind of led me to His church. Um, it was. It's a, it's a weird story. I, I I'll get into it. Yeah, yeah, I guess for sure. <laughs> I'll get into it. It's just been it's just been a whirlwind since wow. we all moved down here, and a lot of a lot of stuff that we've been through. Uh, you know, God has really been blessing us and and been keeping us, and 
man, he's been showing out these these past couple of weeks, and just you know, just I'm just humbled that you know, just to see his hand on this ministry and everything we're doing with One Faith, um, uh, and yeah. So yeah. So it's, tell it's, me a little bit about One Faith. I know I know we got on the time crunch to get things going, but I, I left definitely like to hear a little bit about One Faith, how the podcast got going, and just tell me a little bit about what you hope to uh, accomplish with. It. Yeah, definitely. So One Faith is basically is biblically based. Um, based off of the scripture, Ephesians 4 and 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Um, the sole purpose of one faith is to uni unify the body of Christ according to our shared faith in Jesus Christ. Um, so it's, it's aiming to break down those barriers that usually keep us separated, such as ethnicities, um, opinions, uh, den denominations, you know, man, right. various things that keep us separated. Um, it aims to bring people together, display that unity that is much needed in the world today, and just showcase that, hey, there are, people, there are a body of believers that um, may not look uh, perfect, <laughs> may not look the part, but you know they're believers. Um, right. If anything, yeah, it, when it, when push comes to shove, they look. I mean, they not look, but they have the word down pat. They right. know it a little bit better than some of us know. They they may have a better prayer life um, than some of us have, and it all kind of comes from a situation that happened a while back. Uh, just a brief synopsis. You know, we visited a church down here. Um, and it really just changed my life. Um, the, the young lady that prayed for us, she didn't look like us, like me and you. She was right. she was um, a, a wonderful uh, Caucasian woman, uh, female and tatted up from her neck down to her toes. And, you know, she prayed for us. And it was just I felt her heart in that prayer. And from that moment, I said, you know, I can't I can't just be you know, just so tunnel vision when it comes to this Christianity thing. I have to open up my eyes and, and hopefully help people open wow. up their eyes too and see that, you know, there's a whole world of people out here that loves the Lord. They may not look like us dress up in a nice three piece suit every Sunday. They may not, you know, communicate the, the same way that we do, but they love, they love the Lord. So that's how my faith kind of came into um, existence. Um, the Lord just laid this on my heart, woke me up one, one morning, uh, early one morning. And just, I had a dream. I was, I was Ephesians four and five. And as soon as I woke up, um, he didn't allow me to go back to sleep until I studied it, I studied it, studied it, and studied it. And just what I got from it was this, um, this radio show opportunity just fell in my lap. Um, a couple of months back, one of my friends, he has a radio show, um, and submitted my name for, um, free radio advertising because he knows that I'm a preacher and, and everything like that. So, and when I went down there, got the free radio advertising, I'm using that for my uncle's church so that he can get publicity. Yeah. And also it turned into a radio show opportunity where I could have my own show. And I was like, whoa, never thought that, that was going to ever happen. But here we are to God be the glory. Um, and so I came up, I just prayed and asked God, what do you want me to do with it? Um, and he gave me, he just sent me right back to where it all began with Ephesians 4 and 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and just focusing on that one faith part, which pretty much aims to bring us all together because right. in Ephesians chapter four, you know, Paul talks all about you know, unifying the body of Christ. Yeah. That's all he's talking all about. about and right. that's what this is all about. Unifying the body of Christ, showing that right. unity. Um, you're, you do, you do it every Sunday, man, with your, uh -huh. your church, y'all doing it. And man. so it's like, man. I love it. Man. De definitely want to talk. Can I pray? If you mind, if I pray before we start? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Father, I just thank you for Thomas, and I thank you for the Holy Spirit that I can already feel. God, I thank you that we don't do anything um, just because haphazardly, but it's by assignment only. And so, God, I thank you for this divine assignment. And I pray that the anointing of God would overshadow the airways even before the podcast release, God, that your presence would meet us, God. We ask that you would hum, come Holy Spirit, come in power. I pray that Thomas's voice would be amplified, that you would use it to bless his family, his uh, wife, God, his church, his ministry. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just utilize his voice to amplify your oneness to the world yes. so that others might look and see Christ in us. So, Father, I thank you for this podcast today. God, I just pray that the anointing of God God would fill us in a way that I know that we have plans, but God, Proverbs 16 and 3 says that when we submit our plans to you, that you would prosper them. So Father, we submit our plans yes, for whatever you want to do with this podcast today, that you can have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. You're the first pastor that I've interviewed that prayed before we got started, man. It says a lot. It says a lot. Uh I already know you. I already know you, uh, a man of God, and I know you're a fireball. So I'm just ready. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, look, man, I'm, hey, look, I'm just grateful to be a part. And I heard the Holy Spirit was like, you know, you got to pray before you do it. Because I, 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 I'll say this before we get going. Like, I really just sense, first of all, I don't do anything that is not assignment. Yeah. You know, I have to be led by assignment. It's not never about anything else for me other than, okay, God, why do you want me to do this? And, and mm -hmm. why is it so important for me to do this? But I just, I just keep hearing this word, the Lord is going to amplify your voice. Mm. You know, I think the Lord is going to amplify your influence. Wow. And so, you know, I'm just grateful to be a part of this today. I actually go to Atlanta to shoot a podcast on Monday. Um, I do a podcast every Thursday with a few brothers, well, every other Thursday with a few friends of mine that's really blowing up. Yeah. And um, it's really taking off, man. We started off first night. We had like a thousand people watch it. Wow. And I think we've had over close to 15 to 20,000 people view it already. Wow. And it's only maybe like five or six episodes. And I did a, a podcast last year with Lisa Whittle. Mm. Um, just got done with a uh, press release with Forward Magazine and then did wow. one with the New York Books of Review last year. And in the process of uh, working on my a book with me and Pastor Jay. So, man, man, good things are happening, man. So just keep praying for us. Oh, man, you know, I already got you, Doc. I already got yeah, you, man. Back, man. You, you part of the fam now. So I'm definitely yes, going <laughs> to keep you in the prayers, man. Let's go ahead and get rocking and rolling. So um, first question I'm going to ask you is, what is your why? Man, I think my why is centered around a few different things. Um, first of all, one of the greatest honors of what I get to do is to be a father and a husband. And I feel like the Lord has just not just planted me in the earth to be a pastor, but he's planted me in the earth to be a father and a husband, man. And one of my whys is um, creating a generational legacy for my sons to not repeat the cycle um, that the previous generation um, had to incur. And so um, one of my whys is, is just being a great husband. I never knew um, anything in my family not to, uh, adultery was prevalent. Um, a lot of things happened from grandfathers to parents and never seen a healthy marriage. So I wanted to be a great husband and a father. And then, um, my wife's course is, is pastoring, but even in that is um, breaking the stigma off of the African-American church. I like that. Um, when I learned that and merging with the predominantly white church, um, one of my reasonings was because there were so many things that the African-American church lacked in infrastructure and financing and um, discipleship and leadership. And, and so I want to kind of, you know, be able to be a bridge. So I, I believe that uh, also my wife to be a bridge to connecting uh, different ethnicities to the body of Christ. And um, also just, you know, uh, being on the front lines to help lead what I feel like is a last day revival. Hmm. That's good. You know, it's funny you say all that because it's similar to, it's similar to my heart. You know, we see a lot. I mean, you, you black, you grew up in a black church. I grew up in a black church. Um, and we see a lot of those things, everything that you listed out are, are, issues within the black church, not try, trying to put the black no. church or anything like that. There are issues in the black church that um, a lot of times go unnoticed. Um, and for me, you know, I, I, I look at, you know, the discipleship, the discipleship portion as a big um, factor in, you know, keeping our black brothers and sisters um, in the body of Christ. Because so many times, you know, we see too many um, instances where, you know, it's easy for them to be manipulated um, into thinking that, you know, this is a white man's religion and to thinking right. about, you know, all these other conspiracy and all these other false religions and doctrines. It's easy to manipulate their minds into that because it's, it's almost like at the end of the day, it's like we kind of glorify our skin more than we glorify God. Right. And one of the things that I'm learning, you know, and is that, you know, I love being a Christian. I love being black and I'm not separating the two. But right. you know, I, I feel that we're in a unique season, especially with everything that's going on. We're right. in a unique season where the body of Christ needs to um, immobilize and, of course, come together even more than what we're doing right now. Because that bridge to connect, man, that is like my heart. That's what I want to do right now. And it's, it's feeling that is like fueling my ministry, feeling what I'm doing with One Faith, because I want to connect um, more with, uh, I hate to say like the white church, but I want to connect more with the body of Christ. Right. You know, we are lacking in those areas of discipleship of, of doing uh, various things in the black church. And I feel that, you know, the black church could benefit greatly if we right. were 
adopt a lot of these things. So I, I commend you 100%. I love the, the fact that you said being a father and a husband first. One of the things that I've learned over the years and always been preached and, and I always preach it myself, I, I do not neglect this aspect is that, you know, family is your first ministry. You right. know, you, whatever you do in the home, it's going to be reflecting, you know, whether you go out to preach, pastor, or whatever, you know, yeah. you're going to look at what your family is like, what your family dynamic is like when they, before they hear anything that comes out of your mouth concerning God. And so yeah. I try to make sure that, you know, I'm here present for my kids, present for my wife, present for everything, because, you know, so many times we see this issue in our churches um, that, you know, the men are too busy in church or they're too busy doing things. Um, or not present in church, uh, or they're just not present in in life. Period. Um, and like you said, you want to break that stigmatism. I I've been fortunate enough to have my father in my life, and I've been fortunate enough to um, to have an example of a great marriage. And so I, I I use that, and I and I and I implore that in my life because I want to be a great example to my kid, to my son, uh, and to my daughter and my <laughs> and my child that's on the way. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm building a legacy, building something that a, a better world for them. Uh, like you said, we are in the last days. This is the last yeah. day of the Bible. And I feel that, you know, one of the things about being a Christian, and let me know if I'm rambling because I, I just keep going. No, no, you're good. <laughs> one of the things about being a Christian and, and being a father is that we are ultimately responsible for our children and, and grooming them because the Bible says, um, be fruitful and multiply. Right. And, the way that we create disciples is how we, you know, create disciples within our, um, our household, being right. fathers and being great leaders, you know, you're a pastor, um, but you're not, you know, everyone in the church father, you're, <laughs> you got your own kids, you got the father. <laughs> and, right, so, right. and that's one of the things that we have to understand too, is that, you know, as black men or as people in the church, like, you know, the pastor, the pastor, the father's the father, and let's establish that. So, yeah. That's good, man. So good. So, yeah, man, I love it. I love that. And I, I love your heart for that, because that, that is key. So what the next question will be, what is your testimony for salvation? Um, so I got uh, saved at the age of 12 mm-hmm. and, um, at a church, a small church called Henderson Grove Baptist Church in Salisbury, North Carolina. Okay. Um, most like uh, most young kids, man, that grew up in our day in the Baptist church, man, we would play church and we have a tendency to put on choir robes then because we had choirs Mm -hmm. and I remember one day just playing church um in in the back of my room and I put on my aunt's robe and but I felt something that I never felt before Mm. you know when I put that robe on and so we'd always me and my cousins my cousins and I we would always play church but some hit me that day and um it was something that I'll never forget as long as I live hit me so hard I ran to my grandmother and I told her that it was like I missed my mom or something but it wasn't really that man it was the Holy Spirit man that was the first time that I felt the power of God at the age of 12. Wow. I had a pastor by the name of Reverend Eggert Shepherd. Um, he's deceased now but man a man that really greatly shaped my life and he would um, allow me to come inside of his offices and, and just kind of pour into me we would go to his house and just he really saw the call of God on me at the age of 12 and I remember him baptizing me and me giving my life to Christ at the age of 12. So um, that was my call into salvation. Of course, at the age of 12, I didn't fully understand, but I did believe in purity. I did believe in believing to living right at the, uh, at the age of 12. But of course, like most young kids, we kind of get off course. Yeah. And so I moved in with my dad when I was probably about 13 years old. And from the periods of 13 to probably about 18, man, I, I made some really bad choices but there, there was something that happened between the age of 18 and 19 when I was actually going to St. Oh, man, and I really felt the tug in the Holy Spirit to pull me back. So from the age of 18, I, I kind of got astray from the ages of maybe uh, 14 to 17 and a half, 18. Mm-hmm. By the time I was 18 and a half, like the Lord had called me back and I was fully, I got married at 23. And, oh, wow. you know, about it, I never, you know, legally bought out alcohol from the ABC store like you know that's it's my testimony my, my wife and I weren't physically involved and so we got married the Lord like did a work but I did so much between the age of 13 to 19 that you know um I should have been I, it's the grace of God and I'm still you know been able to do the things that the Lord has called me to do I love that man it, your testimony is so unique and, and my, my, I've interviewed a lot of pastors over this great country over the last couple of weeks and 
man, just hearing the various testimonies, hearing the various stories, they're, they're each, each of them are unique and specific. Um, and of course, everyone's testimony is going to be right. specific to them. But, you know, just hearing your heart and hearing your, your story, man, that that is key because a lot of people, they hear your story and they're like, well, my story is similar. Um, and they may feel that, well, my story, it doesn't matter. Like my testimony doesn't matter because it, it's not that that right. that I catching that that one that he, that catches your ear or yeah. I'm on, on crack in the lord you know call yeah. me out of out of that and you know those type of testimonies and just to hear those type of stories man it's just beautiful because you don't see too many people that that talk about you know being celibate or being um you know with your wife for the first time when y'all got married man that it's it's like few and far between, especially. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't common, man. I mean, it wasn't common for me yeah. because it wasn't my story before. But the Lord really spoke to my heart about purity when I was in college. And, um, you know, check it, saying, you know, I was selling drugs and, and all that kind of crazy stuff before going to college. And when I got into college, I got robbed at gunpoint. And that mm-hmm. night I remember going and uh, the Lord just, you know, I felt like he gave me a, another opportunity, man, just to get my heart right. And the Lord spoke to me in college, like, I don't, I don't want you sleeping with anybody else until I see you your wife. Man. And not even knowing that my wife, unbeknownst to me, was, was doing the same thing. She hadn't been with a man in eight years before she met me. Wow. And so, you know, it was just us really believing God that we wanted, I wanted something to be different in my life, man. I came up in a in a, an environment that I never saw that. And I wanted to, you know, just wanted to make sure that my kids came into, you know, something healthy, something good, you know, it's not perfect at all, but, yeah. you know, definitely wanted to see that you can live right, you yeah. know, and that righteousness and holiness is still something that we can still have in this generation, yeah. you know, and that, you know, it's okay to still be, you know, very, very, you know, modern or, you know, you know, whatever you call it, but still have traditional values that holds true to the church, you know, exactly. until my personal relationship with Christ. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that time. Yeah, I man, I agree. Because for me, you know, I while you're talking, I was just thinking like you, you got married at a young age, 23. I got married at 23, too. And wow. like so many, so many times, you know, you hear stories about people getting married young. They don't, it, it don't turn out right, you know, maybe, you know, they end the marriage after one or two years, but to hear, you know, the stories of people that have been married young and they're still going, it, it's, it, it's needed in a time like today, especially in, in your world where you got your Will and Jada's uh, entanglement. <laughs> entanglement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, entanglement. You know, what true marriage looks like, especially in the Christian community, because right, right. Know, it's prevalent, you know, and it's, it's, we can do it. We are able to do it. God has blessed us um, to be able to do it. And I love it. So appreciate well, it. Man. Your wife, man. I love that. I really do. So um, the next question is, and it kind of, and it kind of did, you kind of answered a little bit with your uh, testimony of the salvation, but, um, when you were called to ministry, did you answer right away? And if not, why did you ignore the call? And what prompted you to eventually um, answer the call? Man, um, first of all, I didn't know what the call was. Yeah. I really didn't know what the call was until I got to college. I was in my, um, there's a book by Rick Warren called The Purpose Driven Life. Mm-hmm. And I remember reading that book chapter by chapter because you can only read like a chapter a day right yeah so you know every day i'd be on edge wanting to read the next chapter like the lord it really gripped my heart it gripped my heart before i left to come to school but he gripped my heart in school yeah so that chapter i would read a chapter a day and i remember so it's a um it's one of the chapters of what am i calling what is my calling mm. and um i clearly heard the audible voice of the lord tell me that i was called to preach the gospel wow and um that was the first time that I ever heard the Lord since I was 12 playing in that role that I heard the stern of the, the voice of the Lord. Like I heard the voice of the Lord during that time, man. And man, something just overtook me in that room, you know, and I remember that room just like really weeping. And I told the Lord, yes, then. Um, but that yes came with some challenges. I, uh, long story short, I left from school that summer, winded up getting in a little bit of trouble Mm-hmm. Um, just really went went one night to get my life back to Christ for a second time because I really felt it was real this time mm-hmm. and um, a decision I could make on my own and wound up going to a mental institution. Wow. So I was in a mental institution for 10 days, man. And that is where I really fully surrendered to the call of God on my life. Wow. It's not until you look at padded walls. It's not until you strap down and until you 
see people uh, that's extremely gifted, man, that didn't obey the call of God. There were so many people that I met in there. It was like, you have to say yes to the Lord. Like, wow. uh, I remember having visions of me going to hell, man, and just wow. waking up every every night in cold sweats, man. Because I got I got some stuff, Thomas, man. I'll tell you, I had some stuff. I was, in, I was into witchcraft. Like, I was into, wow. you know, like, man, I got into some stuff. From 13 to 18, I got into some stuff, man. Yeah. You know, robbing, you know, doing, doing just doing some crazy stuff, man. And so um, the Lord, like, broke me all the way down, man. I was humiliated going to a mental institution, like, and humiliated to the degree where I'm like, God, I don't even know if this is what you're calling me to do. But I say yes to God. The mental institution was a major turn for me saying yes to the call of God. And when I came out of that mental institution, I remember riding with my brother. Um, and and I was like, man, I think I'm gonna go back to selling drugs. He's like, you can't. Yeah, you can't go back. You know, you can't go back to selling drugs. And I was like, all right. He was like, so I said, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna put my whole heart into what you called me to do. And uh, from that day, um, I've been serving the Lord wholeheartedly since then. Man, it sounds like you kind of had like a a mini Jonah moment. It was like you just did your own thing for that, that time period you just, yeah. you know, got involved in some of any, everything in that mental institution. It's kind of like your will. You man, know? it was my will, man. It was, a, it was probably one of the dark, cause I was in a dark depression, man. Didn't know it. I was just in a deep, dark depression. I just lost a son still born, man, 14 hours. Wow. And uh, man, just the things that got me here, man, it was just the grace of God. If I, if I ever knew God, like knew God's love and compassion for me, there were some situations that I shouldn't have survived, man. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have survived. And so the mental institution was my, the belly of the well for me. And when the Lord allowed me to be spit up out of that, you know, I kind of came forth with a new resurgence and a mandate to walk in my calling, man. Not even understanding, fully understanding what preaching the gospel looked like, but I did know uh, that I felt like the Lord was calling me to do something that was bigger than me, man. Yeah. So how did you get started back on that role, on that path after you left the middle institution? Uh, man, I met my wife, man. I met, <laughs> man, I met my wife. I met my wife. I met my wife when I had to go back to Catawba College because I was, I was some legal things I got into, like, um, and so I had to go back and just before I could go back to school, I had to get some things together. My wife was there. She, I worked at this school called Catawba College since I was in high school. Yeah. Never seen this woman. When I came back on break for summer break, she was there. And yeah. she introduced me to her church at the time. I was in a um, Baptist church, never heard of speaking in tongues. Never, none of that, man. It was Baptist, you know. Yeah. Like, you know, we gonna shout and whatever it is, but you, you ain't about to speak in no tongues. Right. Like, I don't know Baptist church. <laughs> not in a prophetic word, you know. Oh, and I, she took me to a church with an apostle by the name of Addie Robinson, man. And I'll never forget the lady. She called me out. Mm -hmm. and told me about the call to preach and the call to ministry. And so my wife, man, my wife was, she would come pick me up. We would just talk. We were friends then. We would just talk about the Lord. She would tell me about my call and the calling that was on my life. And I was still smoking then. Wow. And, uh, and she just told me, she, I remember I was at work one day. She came to me and she's like, um, I need you. The Lord said you, you have to stop smoking because God has need of your voice. Wow. And uh, she spoke into my purpose, man. And I told her, I said, if I just give me one more day, let me finish. Let me finish this. I'm going to finish this up. Mm. And um, I gave it up that week. And I never went back to smoking, drinking, anything, man. She just, and uh, from then, man, we were just like best friends. We talked every day. And she kind of helped me walk to, to, to meeting this church and really getting invested and being really discipling, man taking me to prayer meetings, mm. um, shut in prayer services, mm. and uh, really helped me to cultivate yeah. the call of God that was on my life, man. If it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be sitting here on this podcast, man. I wouldn't be able to pray all over the world and do, doing the things that the Lord has called me to do or asked me to do, man, without without God, man, without my wife, um, him using her to yeah. speak to me. Yeah, that's beautiful. And the fact that, one thing I want to point out, too, the fact that she didn't judge you and just set you aside because you you noted that you were still smoking and everything. Right. Uh, she didn't just, you know, labeled you as a hypocrite and just pushed you aside. Like, you know, he right. got no use for this. You know, she still spoke into your life and spoke directly to your call. That's right. key, you know, and a lot of people will, will say, you know, women uh, aren't important, don't have an important role in ministry. But man, when I tell you, there are women out here, <laughs> 
my um, my pastor used to say he was like, if the women of the church leave the church, I'm leaving because there are some powerful <laughs> women <laughs> in the Jesus, church. Man. Jesus knew that, man. Exactly. Jesus, knew, man, was surrounded by women who could, you know, actually help to cultivate his gift, man, and his call. Exactly. So, you know, man, we need. I wouldn't be where I'm at without women, man. And exactly. it's a crazy thing, man. I have so many um, women, man. One of my my spiritual mom that that died, man. Um, and just those women that, that poured life and virtue into me when I was at my lowest place, man, I wouldn't I wouldn't be here with without my wife, without um a lady by the name of um Kathy 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 Robinson that passed. Um uh, those, those were some women that man just shaped my identity, man, and yeah. it helped me to, to find out who I was. It took time to mold me. Yeah, I, I I love that. I mean, it just takes me back to my mom, because my mom, she she passed, but she was definitely a, a huge voice in in my life um was just keeping me on the straight and narrow she did not so we grew up in durham you you know durham has a reputation of just being just one of the rough terrible yeah. cities oh. the whole world. So, i mean it, there's there's places that are rougher than durham right. <laughs> but right. she did everything that she could her and my dad to make sure that we had a really good life uh, and that we were separated from all that stuff we they kept us in church um and they kept us going in church doing various things i was on the step team i was we were singing i was on the usher board i uh, eventually stopped singing and started playing the drums and you know i remember she she literally spoke the call into my life that i was going to preach she told me one one day um while i was playing the drums, she was like the lord is going to um use you one day she's he's going to pull you from behind those drums to preach um i've known that i was called ever since i was eight uh, i remember uh, i tell this story all the time uh, I remember going to the grocery store with my mom. Uh, we was at Food Line in Durham. I, I I know exactly where I was at, the aisle and everything. Uh, and the lady just looked directly at me and said, you know, you're called to preach. He was like, it's all over your forehead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He like, <laughs> was like, it's all over you. Right. And I was just like, I mean, as a kid, and I didn't understand it. So, I mean, of course, I rejected it because I'm a kid. You know, you're eight. The only thing I'm thinking about is Power Rangers. And how I can go home and play with my toys and all that good stuff. But, you know, as I continue to grow, you know, I just felt like, you know, God was diff definitely pulling me in a different direction. I did my own thing, man. By the I got saved when I was eight. And after that, um, I, I did my own thing. You know, I didn't live the, the, the completely saved life. Um, right. It wasn't until, honestly, until I really um, was about 22 21, 22 ish, when my mom, right before my mom passed, and we, uh, we actually had my son. Um, and because me and my wife, we had, we had my son out of wedlock. Um, yeah. When he was born, that kind of just shifted everything. I remember the moment he was born, I remember holding him in my arms and God just speaking to me and saying, hey, the, the love you have for this kid is the exact same love I have for you. And it's like, I could not understand, you know, how much unconditional love I have for him. And just to in turn hear that from the Lord that, hey, you have, I love you just as much or if not more than that love that you feel for your own son. And that's really when I really just answered the call and say, you know what, I'm just going to answer the call. I'm just going to go all out for this thing because I know that God has called me. I know that uh, there is a purpose. I, I've, I had a dream when I was in college um, that I was preaching. I couldn't shake it. Like I had this dream for a whole month where I just saw myself preaching in the same place, in the same the same exact dream for the whole month. And I'm like, okay, God, I hear you. Uh -huh. And I mean, I, I did do some ministry stuff in college and I did, you know, you know stay involved. I was always around in the church and I, and I stayed going to church, but you know, I was a hypocrite, man. I was a big hypocrite. I, I was like, you know, smoking, drinking, doing, yeah. cussing, doing everything that, you know, I wanted to do because I was in a, a period of a rebellion moment, but, <clears throat> It was really that moment when my son was born that really kind of changed the game for me. And I said, you know, I really got to get it right. Um, because not only is he dependent on me, but I gave him a powerful name. His name is Morell. He's named after my best friend wow. that passed when I was in college. And my friend wow. Morell that, that, that passed when, when he was in college, he was a man of God. Like, I know he in heaven. Like, anybody that knows Morell, <laughs> Domingo, knows that that boy is in heaven. Because the way that he lived his life, he was just a stone cold Christian. Mm. Uh, he came from Africa and he would read his Bible every day. He he told me that he would read he would read his Bible every year twice, like mm. from cover to cover. That's just how disciplined he was. And mm. and I was like, Oh, well, I gave my son that name. I said, I have to, 
I have to live up to, you know, him, who he was, who Morel was, and, and try to be a good example. Um, and so, yeah, my story is, is very significant because I, I heard the call, I seen the call, and one of the services that we attended to um, when my son was born, I just remember seeing a sign over the pulpit. God was just holding the sign and said, you should be here. This is where you're supposed to be. Wow. And since then, I, like I said, I've just been on fire for God and trying to, you know, answer the call and, and do everything that he has called me to do. So, wow. um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely humbled and grateful that God would even think anything of me <laughs> to, bear, to bear this mantle, man. So um, what motivated you to pursue ministry? And you did kind of touch on that with your, with your, with your story, too. A lot of these questions kind of run into each other, but yeah. What That's good, man. That's good. Um, I'm going to be honest, man. I think if I could have walked away from ministry, I would have. Mm. I don't think anything ever motivated me except the tug of God just pulling me into something. Nothing else worked. Mm. Everything literally that I touched outside of ministry crumbled. Wow. For me. And so I think God um, forced me mm. to surrender. You know, um, and and it just things things just wouldn't go right. I never wanted this. I never asked for this. Uh, my dad used to tell me tell me all the time that when I see you preaching all over the world, I see God utilizing your voice to go to different nations. Um, but none of that was really my call. There was no there's no point of reference for me. Mm. Look at it and say this is something that I can desire. I had no point of reference. I had nobody in my family that um, could I could look at it and say, "Man, I, I you know I want to be like them when I grow up." So the call of ministry was just Jesus, like just man. I feel I feel God now, like just just drawing me, man. His yeah. love for me, His pursuit for me, yeah. um, His mercy for me, like the grace that He had for me pursued me in the ministry. And the first ministry that pulled me was the ministry of prayer. Mm. The ministry of prayer. I would shut myself in the church every day for 365 days. I never missed a day. Mm. Never For 360, 365 days, I would go into the church every day and mm. I would cry out to God at the altar. Wow. And I was in one of the driest places of my life. And from that call to prayer, then God gave me uh, a tug for his presence and his word. I would pray three times a day, man. Mm. And just really wanted to, you know, just my prayer life. Cause I knew I couldn't make it. It was so many thoughts in my mind. It was so many things I was wrestling with. So it was the hand of God, like just, that just tugged me and pulled me um, to wanting to know him, not religion, not church. Just, I wanted to know mm. him. I knew what I came out of. Mm. I could not, I could not do this without God. Mm. Because the strongholds and the battles and the warfare was too deep. And I know, I knew that the deliverance that I need, only God could deliver me. Yeah. So that altar, man, altered me. The altar, just weeping and crying out at the altar, changed and transformed my life. That's what did it. That is a bar. The altar altered me, man. God, I got that. Let me write that down. <laughs> <Take the notes. laughs> yeah, man. man, that is powerful. It's like when you think about, you know, those pivotal moments when God just speaks to you, he speaks directly to you and just him moving in you. It's, 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 it's indescribable. It's indescribable. Right. It's like, you can't, you can't fathom his presence ever leaving you. I mean, that's just how I feel whenever I feel God's presence. And it's like, I don't want to know what it's like not to feel his presence. I know what it's like to be a sinner before knowing Christ but I don't want to, I don't ever want to know what it's like to be um, somebody who just loses God's presence after you've known God and felt him and just been in his presence all this time. Uh, Man, gosh. So. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. So. That's good. Um, so what motivates you now to continue in ministry? I know you, you kind of touched on it too. So. The presence. The presence. The presence, man. Um. The presence, man. I can't make it without the presence of God. That's powerful. Like I can't, I can't. I'm not that smart. I'm not that deep. Like it's the presence of God. Like nothing that I have in my life 
I think when you come from a low place, man, you know that the places that you are, you don't deserve to be here. Mm -hmm. My track record would disqualify me. Um, my skill set would disqualify me. My past should disqualify me. But what keeps me motivated is, God, you, you, you delivered me. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know the song "You're a Ransom My Life." You know, yeah. and I'm never going back. Like, mm -hmm. you're a ransom for me from me as an individual. And I'm not just saying this to sound good, like from me, from me, that you thought this much about me to save me, to deliver me. When I look at everybody else around me, everybody else that came out of what I came out of that didn't survive, and I look about mm -hmm. near death situations that I should have been in that other people died in that you spared me in. Man, uh, that motivates me even when I feel unmotivated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get up, I'm like, man, I don't want to do this church stuff, man. I'm so over this and over people and over church people. But then he reminds me that this is not about you. This is about me and what I want to do through you. And that motivates me to keep going and be inspired to go forward, man. To be honest, it's just his presence and my pursuit of him. I'm, I have not lost my pursuit. I'm still hungry. Mm. Like I'm still hungry like I was 12. Mm. And I think the moment that I, 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 I lose my hunger, I will lose my motivation. Yeah. So I want to I want to stay hungry for the presence. And platforms don't feed us. Presence uh -huh. does. You uh, right. You know, like none of this stuff feeds us. It'll never feed you if His presence is not there. Like if you're not in pursuit of His glory. And I know this generation is not the generation that wants to talk about the presence of God. But we got to be glory carriers, man. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get up and do anything without presence. I don't want to do a podcast without prayer. I don't want to get up in the morning and pray and open my mouth and not be able to decree and declare anything that God's presence doesn't back because I've been in his presence. Mm -hmm. So his presence continues to motivate me, man. I love that, man. I love it. I, I feel God right now in this conversation, man. It's just, yeah, this is, this is good. This is man. good. I, I'm about to just throw the questions away. <laughs> you just preach. <laughs> <laughs> preach on the present. Preach on this present. Oh, Forget what's the why. Let's talk about God's presence. <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's oh. like mine. And likewise, man, you, you set an atmosphere that it feels good. It feels. I, I feel God on this, man. I really do. I feel. I feel like somebody that's going to hear this needs to hear that. Yeah, they're going to need to hear this. And that's the whole intent, because. The um the purpose behind this, it, everything about one faith is spirit based. It's not you know me coming up with this grand idea and I'm just rolling with it. No, it's it's definitely led by God. The very first episode I did, um, I had everything lay, laid out. I had started recording it, started doing everything, putting everything in place, and God literally just spoke to me. And it was right around the time George Floyd um was was murdered, and he literally said, "Stop what you're doing," and record about this situation and record yeah. about the need for racial reconciliation even in the midst of all that stuff because there's so many people you've seen it so many people just i'm just going to do all things black 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 right. and god did not call us to do that you know god called us to unite god called us yeah. to be uh one body one church not just yeah. to be separated uh and god man that I, I feel his presence every single time I, I do a, a, pro, a podcast. Um, I'm constantly asking God, what do you want me to tell the people? You know, what do you want me to, um, to put out here? You know, I'm not putting anything out here that is just fluff or is just came to my mind. No, uh, everything, every conversation I've had with the special guests, the, 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 um, the pastors, or if I've done a podcast by myself, it has been um, spirit based and led based by God because you know, like you said, without God, none of this is possible. Like mm -hmm. this platform, it wouldn't be possible without God. Like I've been wanting to do a podcast for five years <clears throat> and every single year I, I've said I wanted to do it. I've been scared to do it. And it's like with God dropping this opportunity with the radio show in my lap, it's like God is saying, do it now. Now it's the, now it's the time to do it. And honestly, I, I just thank God that I have this platform because being a, a, a young elder, a young preacher in, in the gospel and in ministry, you know, it's tough. It's very tough, especially um, coming from, you know, my background in my church, you know, it, it's, it's very hard to establish yourself, to, to build a name and a reputation for yourself 
um, if you don't already have a name or your name isn't um, popular. Uh, no one knows McKnight unless you think that I'm related to Brian McKnight. That's not <laughs> yes, that. well, But in the church world, you know, you really have to build your stuff. You have to build your brand. And I feel that, you know, it's hard to do that when the opportunities are limited. It's hard mm. to do that when you don't have um, everything at your disposal to help build you. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with just the culture of the church. Yeah. But I think too, and thinking back on it now, and I'm, I'm really helping myself in this moment is that, you know, in that moment or in that season, you know, it's like God was really um, cultivating me and maturing me um, and preparing me for this moment, for everything that's going on right now with the podcast and the radio show. Right. Because, you know, if I hadn't just been silent or scared, then I wouldn't have learned the Bible the way that I know the Bible now. I wouldn't have learned God or been more um, stronger in my faith right. with him if I had just went out there and said, I want to build my name and just that. For right. me, I, I do want to build my name, but that's right. not the motivation behind this. It's the whole motivation behind One Faith is to unite people, God's people. That's my name being attached to it, that's, that's just the byproduct of it, but it's solely to to unite God's people. That's, that's what it's good, all about. Man. That's good. I, I'll make, a, make this comment because in First Samuel 16, we, mm -hmm. we knew that David was not, um, was not Israel's choice. Yeah. yeah. Saul he, he wasn't it. even uh, Samuel's choice. Mm -hmm. He wasn't his father's choice. And he wasn't his family's choice. Mm -hmm. But he was God's choice. That's right. And if you if you read that scripture, the one of the most amazing things for me about this, because I we always talk about being tight Davids, that um, when David was called into the house and anointed king, he wasn't surprised. His family was, because mm -hmm. there's been relationships building out in the field that people inside of the house would never understand. Mm. So sometimes if we abandon the seasons of being out in the field where God grooms us, qualifies us, speaks to us our destiny in the field, when we get into the house, though people are surprised because David wasn't their first, second, third, or fourth choice, but he was God's choice. Mm -hmm. The scripture never says that David was surprised that he was anointed king. Mm. His family was. Mm -hmm. So there's some things that God is speaking to us in private that might surprise everybody else when God brings our name up. Yeah, But it should not surprise us because God has been speaking to us while we've been in the field. And what I would tell any anybody is don't abandon your season of being in the field. Okay. And um, because in the field, there's some things that God is speaking to you so uniquely that people in the house, and can I be honest, even the prophet Samuel would have missed him mm. because he was still grieving over what he thought should be. Mm -hmm. And so, um, by the, so when, when I when God is bringing your name up, he's not bringing your name up because people would pick your name. Mm. He's bringing your name up because they didn't pick your name, mm. but God is going to make your name great. He'll, he'll exalt you in due season, you know, and he'll exalt your name when you exalt his name. And so that's the thing that I learned. I didn't come from any preaching background, the platforms oh. that the Lord has given me. There's nobody that knocked down doors and say, open this door for him. Listen, I've, I've, I've exalted him. I've spent my time with him in the field and now God is bringing me in the house and people are like, who is this? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that you had another son out in the house. I mean, out in the field because you, and sometimes you think that you're hidden, but God is like, no, God is keeping you concealed so that he can reveal you for the season that he needs you most because true prophetic voices or people that God uses are only brought out in crisis. Mm -hmm. So God will use a, crisis to elevate your name or to elevate your anointing. God will never pull your anointing to the forefront until a crisis uh, desires your anointing to be pulled. Yeah. God needed David's anointing for a specific time. And the first assignment was to go deal with Goliath because everybody else was too scared to deal with it. So I think if we just wait on our seasons and our times, when our anointing is needed, that's when our name will be magnified. Man, you got to say that again. You got to say that needed, last part again. That's when our names will be magnified. Golly, man. That, that is powerful. That, let me. Let me. <laughs> Stop, 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 stop. I'm glad I recorded this. I'm gonna go back and take some notes. <laughs> man, 
I'm you telling know, you, man. You know, man, that story of David is so true because it, it, even when like even when he went to go um, and deal with Goliath, when he when he got to the camp, what's the first thing everyone was? What's the first thing he said to everyone? Like y'all scared? Of, who is this dude? Who is this Philistine? Like, like y'all scared of him, man? Y'all scared of him? I'm gonna give you his head. That's right. What I'm gonna do. Oh my god. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. So um. Now you spoke you spoke on on this a little bit, but have you ever wanted to quit ministry? If so, why? People, man. Yeah. Um, one of my mentors always says this to me: No matter what you do, it will never be good enough for people. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you do; it will never be good enough. So you have to know what and who are you doing it unto. Because if you're doing it for people, it'll never be good enough. Um, my earliest stages in ministry, I made so many mistakes as a leader, imperfect man, um, but people almost took me out. Mm. People's opinion of me almost destroyed me. So much so, much so in the first year, I, gra- I gained like 40 to 50 pounds. Mm. And I was unhealthy, overweight, hardly breathed, couldn't fit any of my clothes. And I went to the doctor. He's like, man, you're borderline 260 pounds. I've been 185 pounds my whole life soaking wet. Wow. Big as I was, was 205. And I prayed to get to 205. I'm 255 pounds, man. Mm. Stress um, almost killed me, took me out of my first year of ministry because I was trying to please everybody mm. and not pleasing God. So for me, People pleasing has almost like almost destroyed me and almost had me to quit. And then the false set of expectations that we have a tendency to put on ourselves that God never placed on us. God never asked us to be God. Right. He never asked us. He asked us actually to be under shepherd. He is the shepherd. Mm-hmm. So we're not responsible for people's salvation. Mm-mm. We're tour guides. Right. Like our job is just to lead them to the one who is able to save so when i took that pressure off of me man to say no matter what a person feels about me all is well you know (laughs) um i give myself the grace to make mistakes Mm. i give myself the grace not to be perfect and i and i give myself repentance um that i repent if i if i i take ownership and repentance is really from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change your mind. Religion t- teaches us to change our actions. Yeah. Relationship t- changes us to t- change our mind. And then God can change our actions. Mm. So when God changes our mind, then he can change our actions. We can't change our actions first. That's religion. So I had to, I had to get back from that and like, okay, God, only you can do this work in my mind and in my heart. And when I got that revelation, weight lifted off of my shoulders. I can't please everybody. There's some people who are going to leave you no matter how great you do it. Mm. It doesn't matter how great you do it. Some people are not, not going to be assigned to you. And you just have to do and steward well the people that God has sent you. And then admit when you make mistakes, take ownership. Like every person that left you, they didn't leave because they were wrong. You were wrong. Like, you know, so I'm mean, like taking ownership for the mistakes and um, the wrong turns that we make. Man, you just said. But something. people almost killed me, bro. You said a mouthful. It's like Jonathan Nelson's song, "Lord, Lord, deliver me from people." I'm telling you, man. It's, it's the honest of God truth. Yeah. Like, what were you saying? Big brother Jonathan and Reynolds killed that man for yeah. real. Yeah, deliver me from people. <laughs> God knows. I mean, I, I'm kind of dealing with that in this season right now, just dealing with people, um, and just wanting to be free from the. I'm a person where I do care about um, a lot about what people think about me and what a lot of people say about me. Uh, contrary to popular beliefs, whoever hear this, because I always say that I don't care what people think and I just do or say whatever. But I do at the end of the day, and there's a level to wanting, you know, acceptance and everything like that. But I, the season that I'm in is, is very unique because, you know, when you desire um, relationship with people, um, especially those of influence and those that you have been um, inspired by for, for a long time, you've respected for a long time and you don't understand why it's not happening um, regardless of your efforts. And it's like your opinion, their opinions of you change 
and you don't know why or what happened. That's the season I'm in. I'm, I'm navigating through that. And what I'm learning now is that I have to let it go. For some reason, it's reminding me, and I was talking to my wife about this last night, it's reminding me of uh, the story with Moses um, when he went back to Pharaoh and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Anytime, during any of that time, God could have not hardened Pharaoh's heart, but he still hardened Pharaoh's heart because he had to prove a point. Right. And I feel that this is similar to that situation. You know, God hardened in the heart of certain people, of certain individuals to pull out more of his presence out of me or to use me in this season. Um, because if I would have stayed, if I would have stayed and, and been doing the things that I was doing before, I would have never had this platform. I would have never been able to step into what God is doing for me right now. Um, and that, and that, that, that's, 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 that's what I'm dealing with. And it's, it's trying to navigate through that. And I think that for me, I have to really let it go. Um, let those people go, understand that, you know, God has a purpose and a plan. Um, everything that he has shown me, it's contrary to, um, what I have, not my beliefs or anything like that, but it's contrary to what I've been shown. Um, just from the past and I have to step into what God is doing now, um, totally abandoned before and just step into what God is, is doing now. Mm -hmm. And earlier I was liking it to a, uh, um, I, I played basketball um, growing up and I played in high school. I was liking it to God kind of gave me this e example analogy. It's like when you're in the gym and you're shooting, um, and as long as you hit the shots, your form could be all out of, out of whack. Nobody really cares. Mm. But the amount of shots you take as you're taking those shots, you know, you could, you could be hitting, you know, a lot of them. But if you're taking a certain attempt, a certain amount of attempts, you know, your percentage is going to be low. Yeah. So it's not until you start to, you know, correct your form. When you start to correct your form, you have to completely abandon what you've been taught that has worked for you in the past in order to be more effective. Right. That is what I'm le learning right now is that I have to correct some things, uh, correct what I've been uh, completely, I won't say completely unlearn what I've done wrong, but completely unlearn what I felt works and uh, completely adapt to what God is, is showing me now, um, buy into what he's showing me and what he's doing and just do that to be more effective in ministry and in life. So. Yes. Dope, man. So good. Yeah. So, so good. Um, yeah, our time is about up. <laughs> Sorry about that. Are you good? Um, how can do you still have a little bit more time or do I do, Yeah, 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 yeah. You're good. Okay. Uh, how can your why inspire someone else to find their why? My why uh, is not your why. So mm -hmm. you have to find your why. Even though my why from afar might inspire you in some areas. My why can never fully inspire you because my why isn't your why. Absolutely. So you have to find your why. Mm -hmm. And hopefully my why inspires you to find your why. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what my why can do for you. But my why in itself can never fully inspire your why because your why is the assignment that God has purpose for you to walk in. Mm -hmm. So. For anybody out there, I would just tell them to discover your why and then find peace with your why and know that the older you get, the more turns and, and life lessons you you learn, your why will change. Will. Some seasons, your why will change, you know, and you have to be adaptable to seasons that change and they'll just get stuck in one way that the Lord is leading. That's good. That is so good. Uh, how can someone find their purpose in God and in life? Um, seek the one who gives purpose. Yeah. Also connect to points of references. Because mm. sometimes you can look at other people and get direction to your purpose because your purpose might be similar. That's why we have fathers and mentors and right. people to pour into us. So yeah, I believe connecting. Some, some for me has always been connected to my points of reference, to people who look like what I want to become. Yeah, you know, and that's and I surround myself with those individuals. So I connect with people who have their purpose, and I ask them to pour into me. 
Um, the scripture says, mark the perfect man. I'm marking people that I desire to be like, you know, like that's why Elisha and Elisha, like, like that's why Timothy marked Paul and Paul marked Timothy. Like you can, you can find some people, even though our, our callings are not the same, there's similarities in our calls. And I believe that you can associate yourself with people that are going in the same direction as you, because you have to be exposed to what your next is. And some of the things that hinder us from becoming what we feel like we're supposed to become is because we've never been exposed to it. Mm. So one of the greatest gifts that God can give you is the gift of exposure to exposing you to people who are doing what God has called you to do. So my um, statement would be find someone who can expose you to what God has said about your future. God. And I'm telling you, if it's the right person that God has marked for you to glean from, they will lean in your direction. Mm. Well, you're speaking right directly to me. <laughs> it was leaning your direction, I'm telling you. Right, that's good. So, um, how can, well, yeah, our, our, this is the last question, and our time is well spent. And um, and I, I, I want to thank you for taking this time to, Any to, time, me, um, to be a part of this show, to be a part of One Faith. Man, I, I'm a little, I'm a little sad because our time is up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was good. We'll exchange information, man. We'll stay connected. Man. Definitely. Um, yeah. So where can people find you to connect with your um, ministry? So um, so my church is the Refuge Church in Greensboro. You can follow us on Instagram on our Facebook page. My personal pages are, um, I think it's Derek Hawkins on Facebook. You can look me up. I have two pages now, professional page, because I'm at capacity on my private page. So um, you can follow me on my professional page or follow me on my private page or you can follow me on um, at Derek D-E-R-R-I-C-K-H-W-K-N-S on Instagram and I love to stay connected with you guys.